Hello everybody, and welcome to a new episode of Gaming in the Wild, a video games podcast about games from the creative, artistic side of the tracks, from indie to AAA. My name's John, I'm your host, and this week we have moved over into December. I'm recording this on Friday the 2nd of December to go out tomorrow. And that means that we are getting into the last part of this year, and we're getting towards one of my favourite times in the the gaming calendar, and that is the game of the year time, when we look back across all the games that we played in 2022, when everyone is going through all of the the highs and lows of the year, picking out all of their favorite games. And one of the reasons that I like this time of year is because it's when everyone decides to talk about the things that they really liked. So the somewhat fraught gamer discourse will shift into positivity and celebration of the medium. Um, And you get to hear about all of the things the different personalities like, what appealed to them, what appealed to them in their own taste bracket and in their own interest niches. Um, And I love that time of year. I love to hear how the year was for JRPG fans and indie game fans and how the, uh, you know, the best driving games that came out and just to, to see the things that people really attached to and really fixated on and really connected with. Um, It's a great time to look through all of those lists and hear what everyone was up to, pick out some new games that you maybe missed in the shuffle and see what comes out on top, you know. Um, And I obviously have my own favourites. Listeners of the show that are regular will know that I love to, to list out my faves. And so I've had a list going since earlier in this year and I'm looking forward to going through it and getting it all and shuffling it all into a final order. I've got about 15 games that are in the running and then a handful of extras. And across the course of the next month, I'm going to be dipping into a few of those games again just to see if my initial impressions held up, to jockey a few games against each other and to just try and get a longer view on the year that was, what the best games were like. Like, I haven't touched a lot of these games since I finished them. Like, I haven't been back to Stray, for example. I haven't really been back to Norco. Um, So lots of the games that you've heard me talking about on this podcast this year, I think I'd like to go back to and just play a half hour of, just visit, revisit a save file, run around in the game again and just see how it feels with a few months between me and that game. So I'm looking forward to that and I'm hoping to have a bunch of interesting guests on the show in the coming weeks to talk about their favourite games of the year. So I'll be hoping to bring back a couple of people that you've heard before and maybe have a couple of new people on to to tell us all about their taste and their 2022 in gaming. Um, But before all of that really kicks off, I'm going to, this week, talk about a big game that came out recently that I have played through and finished. That's God of War Ragnarok. Um, I did an episode about God of War 2018 a couple of weeks ago. I have played Ragnarok now, um, all the way to the finale, uh, rolled credits on that one. So I'm going to do a little review of that game. I also wanted to talk about a couple of other things that I played this week. Um, I went back to Citizen Sleeper. There have been two DLC for Citizen Sleeper this year, and in the spirit of going back to games that are jostling for position on my games of the year, um, I thought I would go back and play a couple of the DLC. It's a perfect excuse to go back to a game that you really liked when there is DLC to dip into, just to get that flavour again. And I'm also going to talk about a game that I got a code for called Wavetail, and I've been playing that um, every night for the last three days since the code came in. I've been playing it on my Xbox Series S, so I'm going to discuss that one a little bit too. But before all of that, it's the start of December, it's the start of a new month, and as is now traditional, at the start of each month I go through the release calendar for the month and uh, flag up a couple good games that are coming out. There's quite a lot this month, actually. This is not by any means a complete list of all of the games that are coming out, although you can find those online. These are just the ones that have caught my attention for one reason or another, or that I wanted to flag to you in case you find it interesting. Um, First of all, on the 1st of December, Inscription came to the Switch. Um, This was my game of the year last year. Um, You may have heard me talk about it before. Um, It's a card game with a strange dark story. Um, It subverts your expectations. It's a pretty fantastic game. Um, In fact, I am going to be on another podcast talking about that one. I'm going to be on the podcast Tales of the Backlog, um, and they have an inscription episode coming out 
uh, later this month, and I talk about Inscription for several hours on that one. I absolutely love that game. So Inscription is now on the Switch, as well as on the other consoles. Um, I haven't heard anything about how it runs on Switch, but I think it will probably run okay, and it seems like Daniel Mullins runs a pretty tight ship when it comes to performance and bugs, etc., Um, So I think you can probably bet on Inscription. Um, There is also a physical edition coming out. Um, I've been hovering over the buy button on that um, just because uh, one day if I have an old Switch OLED and all of the consoles have moved on and the eShop has closed and all of that horror scenario, um, it would be really nice to have a little pile of classic Game of the Year style Switch games. Um, I have Kentucky Route Zero, I have Mutazioni, I have a couple of Nintendo titles and adding Inscription to that little pile Um, appeals to me a little. Anyway, um, so Inscription is now out on Switch. Um, Today is the 2nd of December, and today the Callisto Protocol came out. Um, Interestingly, the reviews on this one were embargoed until today, and we kind of saw why, I think. Usually, if a game um, releases the reviews early, it's because they are going to be positive, they know they're going to be positive, and they want to build up anticipation of people reading all of these positive reviews and getting ready for release. However, if an embargo, a review embargo happens on the day of release, as happened recently, for example, Sonic Frontiers, it might mean that they are less confident in how good those reviews are going to be, and they want to let people pre-order the game right up to release date and buy it on release date without having read the reviews. Um, And on Callisto Protocol, that seems to have been the case. It's been pretty much slammed by critics that I greatly admire, such as Ralph of Skillup, who tore apart the combat in Callisto Protocol and said that it's simplistic, um, shallow, and that the story is not good, and that it's very pretty, but not much fun. Um, it's in the 70s on Metacritic, and that's a real surprise to me. This is a game made by the original developers of Dead Space. Um, I played a little bit of that this year and really enjoyed it, so I was quite interested. I was watching with interest to see where the critics came down on the Callisto Protocol, and it turns out it's not that hot. So for me, that one has been bumped back from a potential buy to being something that I will wait for on a deep sale, maybe, or just wait until it's on a subscription service. Um, If a high-budget game like this um, gets creamed by the reviewers, um, odds are sales will be lower, and maybe it will be more likely to try and recoup some of that production money by going on to PlayStation Plus or Game Pass, etc., So let's just see what happens with Callisto Protocol. Um, On the 5th, looking forward, there is a game coming out called Swordship by Digital Kingdom. Um, This is an interesting one for fans of retro games, I would say. It looks a little like um, an old-fashioned shoot-em-up. It has a polygonal ship, um, very dynamic, speeding forward across like a flat background. But rather than being a shoot-em-up, where you are blasting out projectiles and dodging bullets and bullet hell and that kind of thing, it looks like this is a dodge em up where enemies will flood the screen and they will try and uh, lock onto you. And if you move correctly, you can use their weapons against them. For example, let them lock onto you, dodge at the last minute, and allow that projectile to hit another ship that's behind you. So it's almost like a runner mixed with a dodging game, mixed with a shoot em up style of thing. Um, so that one looks quite interesting. I'm going to keep an eye on the reviews for Swordship on the 5th. On the 7th, Togs is coming out. This is a game that I flagged up last week. It's a 3D platformer with a, a building element to it. So you run around in a 3D world. It looks Nintendo-ish, I would say. Um, and you can build up platforms, almost like the Lego games, but just much more quick and dynamic than the Lego games. So you can throw down some platforms to create steps for yourself. Uh, and that kind of thing. So that looks really fun to me. Uh, Togs is out on the 7th. You'll hear me talking about that one again. I have a code for that one, so I'm looking forward to playing it. On the 9th, a game that I've talked about a whole bunch, um, Choo Choo Charles. It's a shame that this one missed the Halloween window. This is the horror open world train game where you're on a little steam engine going around the world, um, a dark nighttime world, and there is a bizarre train chasing you that is not tied to the tracks and has giant spider legs. It looks like a horror nightmare AI generated Thomas the Tank Engine spider train that just comes running after you and you have to gun at it, you have to avoid it, you have to get out of your train and become vulnerable and run out into the world, this this twilight world. So that's a, a real cool indie horror game. Um, it went a little viral when the first footage appeared because Choo Choo Charles is just the most horrific thing. 
Um, it's it's really effective horror game. So I'm I'm interested in that one. It's only coming out on PC to start, um, and I do like to try games on console, as I don't really have a PC gaming setup. So um, I'll just watch the reviews on that one as well, and hope that it gets a console release. Um, on the 13th, High on Life is coming out. This is a game that I've mentioned before as well. It was pushed back last month. It's a first-person cartoon shooter where the pommel of your gun has a face on it that talks to you. Um, so you're blasting your way through this cartoon world. Um, it was made with help from the creators of Rick and Morty, which might give you um, a clue as to the atmosphere of this one. That's coming to Game Pass, so I'm quite keen to try that one out without having to put any money on the table. Um, on the 14th, The Witcher 3 Next Gen is coming out. Um, I'm taking a long holiday break in the UK this year um, to visit family, to visit with my brother who's coming back from Australia for the first time in a while. And I've been thinking, what's my gaming life going to be like over this Christmas holiday? I think I've decided to throw my tiny Series S into my case and take it with me because they all go to bed pretty early. There are going to be some long nights uh, with the curtains drawn where I can put a game on the TV and get in some good Christmas holiday gaming time. And Witcher 3 Next Gen and High on Life and all of these games are ones that I would like to try. So I bought The Witcher 3 for the third time. I have it on Switch. Um, I've lent that cartridge to a friend because I don't want to play it on Switch after seeing how it runs. Um, I have it on PlayStation, but my PlayStation 5 will be here in Iceland, too big to take with you anywhere almost too big to have in your house, the PlayStation 5. So I've bought it again. I think it was on £5 on sale for the Series S, and that is a free next-gen upgrade on the 14th. So I will have The Witcher 3 with me now in the UK, so maybe that can be my Christmas game. Um, on the 15th, there's a game coming out called Black Tail. This is a first-person archery game uh, with a dark, fairy tale, witchy atmosphere going on where you're running through a cursed forest it could be interesting. It looks a little skyrim -y maybe, something like that, or roughly analogous to that. I don't know a huge amount about Blacktail, but it is one that I will be looking at with interest. Um, on the 15th as well, uh, the second last game I have here is Melatonin. This is a game that was in a Nintendo Indie Direct recently. It's a rhythm game about sleeping, where you go through a series of surreal dreams uh, with various kinds of rhythm gameplay. It looks a little bit like mini-games in the WarioWare style, but with a very soft-edged, hand-drawn, uh, dreamy feel to the whole thing. So Melatonin looks interesting. I will be clocking the reviews on that one too. Um, the last game that I have here, it's listed in some places as being on the 15th, um, but in other places as being quarter four. So I don't know if this game has been knocked back or not, but it's Nyad. This is a game that I talked about during Steam Next Fest when a demo was briefly available. You may have seen it if you're on Game Dev Instagram or Gamer Instagram. Um, you're looking down onto a river from above, uh, beautiful bright colours, uh, rippling water, um, and a naiad, a fairy swimming, uh, wheeling through the water clockwise and anti-clockwise amongst uh, plants and amongst you know aquatic stuff amongst fish and all of that kind of thing and frogs um, and you have to swim down a river in a very mellow game about uh, nature and magic so uh, Nyad is supposed to be coming out on switch playstation and pc i believe um but i wouldn't be surprised if Nyad goes back into next year it's a game that's been long in development um, but i'm dying to try the final version of that one too Game Pass has some treats as well this month. Um, already on Game Pass as of today is Eastward. And hilariously, we were all talking about Eastward in this show's Discord uh, just yesterday, saying, wouldn't it be great if Eastward came to Game Pass? I literally said those words. I'm waiting for it to come onto a subscription service. Um, and it appeared. It appeared the next day. So Eastward, the pixel art, old-fashioned RPG, top-down, Zelda-ish, beautiful pixel art, um, I was very happy to see that the soundtrack is by Joel Korolitz, who made the classic soundtrack to The Unfinished Swan. Um, I will always play a game with a soundtrack by Joel Korolitz. He's one of those people like uh, Disaster Peace uh, or Scientific, where I will play a game with their name attached to it. Uh, Austin Wintry as well. I will play games that they attach themselves to. I think they find good projects and that their music adds a huge motivation for me to try the game. So, um, yeah, Eastwood, looking forward to trying that. Um, on the 6th on Game Pass, uh, LEGO Star Wars The Skywalker Saga is coming out. I own that one, and I can say that it is a real nice uh, switch-your-brain-off 
comfort food game. Um, on the 8th, Chained Echoes is coming out. I don't know much about that one other than that it's a retro style JRPG. On the 13th, Potion Craft is coming to Game Pass. Um, I think I've become a little confused about all of these potion games. There's another one called Potion Permit. There is a potion mixing game called Strange Horticulture. And now we have Potion Craft. And there was one with Witch in the title too. Not exactly sure what Potion Craft is, but this is definitely um, a wholesome games uh, micro trend going on here for potion mixing games. Um, and on the 15th, finally, on Game Pass, Hot Wheels Unleashed is coming out. Everyone who has played this has said that it's a great time. Um, I have it on PlayStation Plus from earlier in the year. Haven't tried it yet. Um, but Hot Wheels Unleashed is coming to Game Pass on the 15th. Uh, PlayStation monthly games have been announced. Biomutant is finally coming out, which I'm really excited about. Um, I was quite keen on this one, but it got slammed critically. So I've just been waiting patiently for it to come to a subscription service. And here it is. So I'm looking forward to trying that one out. And also the Mass Effect Trilogy Remastered is free on PlayStation Plus this month. Uh, those two games come out on December 6th. So that's the, the month ahead. Um, and let's get into a couple of these games that I have to talk about, starting with Wavetail. So I'm only going to do a little preview of Wavetail. It is still under embargo. It's coming out on the 12th of this month. Um, I was just Googling before the podcast to try and find out who developed this game. Um, and I got some confusing results because it is published by Thunderful, um, this uh, Nordic publisher, I believe, who have been buying up a whole load of interesting studios recently. Uh, one of the studios that they bought a couple of years ago now is Zoink, um, the developer of Thea, a game that I've talked about on this podcast, Fea F-E. And it looks like um, Zoink, who also made Lost in Random, another game that I've talked about on this show, uh, weren't only bought by Thunderfall, but have been folded into a new company called Thunderfall Games. So the studio that we knew as Zoink is no more um, in name. It is now Thunderfall Games. And Thunderfall Games has several divisions. So I think it's turned all of the studios that it has bought into Thunderful Games. So this game was actually made by the same people as Thea and Lost in Random. That's what matters. Um, and the music for this game, Wavetail, was made by Yoel Billet, who made the music for Thea. Um, I've used that music on the podcast so many times. It's an amazing cello soundtrack. It's one of my favorite game soundtracks. And it explains a lot. I've been playing this game and marveling at the music um, and it being by Yoel Billy, who did the music for Fea, makes a lot of sense. Um, so Wavetail is a third person, I guess you would call it a traversal action adventure. Um, and in this game, you play a young girl who lives on an island with her grandmother. And at the start of the game, you get a special ability that allows you to skate and surf over the sea. Um, and this tiny island where you live, turns out that it's the very top of a flooded world in the uh, the water world movie style so it's a flooded earth game and you can see the very tops of skyscrapers sticking out of the ocean as you travel uh, by skimming over the top of the water on cresting waves jumping up into the air gliding you get a double jump right at the start of the game you can dive under the water you can speed over the waves between the islands and you do a little bit of platforming here and there um, and the story unfolds about what's going on in this world. It's all about the traversal, though. Um, I've been completely in love with the few days that I've played of Wavetail. I'm going to keep playing that one over the next few weeks, um, and I'll be talking about it again for sure. This is a very interesting game, and I think a lot of people will like this one if they liked The Pathless, if they like Jet Set Radio-style games, if they enjoyed Solar Ash... Uh, this is a game with a similar sense of freedom of movement, something that I always love in games. Um, so keep an eye on Wavetail. It's coming out in a couple of weeks, um, and I will come back to Wavetail and talk about it again. But the next game I'm going to talk about before we get into God of War Ragnarok is the DLC for one of my favorite games of the year. Um, you'll be hearing me talking about this one again, and I think you'll be hearing a lot of people talking about this as Game of the Year season is upon us. 
It is Citizen Sleeper. episode on Citizen Sleeper earlier this year with a guest, uh, Jani from Sifter. We had a great conversation about Citizen Sleeper. If you would like to hear a full review of that game, then feel free. It is in the backlog of this uh, of this podcast. You can seek that one out. Um, but it has since then had two DLC packages. Um, there is a third planned that has slipped back into early 2023. And together, those three DLC packages form a whole new story arc in the game. And this is a wonderful game in which you arrive on a space station in a synthetic body that needs a certain proprietary medicine to survive, otherwise you will just crumble and fall apart. Basically, a refugee, has you've escaped from a, your corporate overlords, and you find yourself a second-class citizen in a crumbling space station on the edge of the universe. Um, the music is absolutely wonderful. It is by Amos Ruddy. Uh, the game is developed by Gareth Damian Martin, who made In Other Waters. Um, and it's a, a wonderful game. It's a lot of text, a lot of decision making, some tabletop elements, uh, such as dice rolls. At the start of each day in this game, you roll several dice. You can choose how to spend them. So if you have a couple sixes, a couple threes, and a one, you can use your sixes on encounters that you know you need to win. Uh, for example, dangerous physical labor, salvaging in space. Uh, you can use that one on uh, something that has no risk just to see what happens. Uh, or there are other uses for low die rolls too. Um, so the game is really, for me, it's an atmosphere. Um, I absolutely adore this game. Um, it has this far cold atmosphere um, of, of being out there, lost somewhere. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful atmosphere. And when I started playing the game again, I immediately felt taken back to that place, partially by the music, partially by the great writing um, and the lovely um, graphics that you see, which are like a, a diagram of the space station, really, seen from the outside uh, with uh, drawn characters in that RPG style will flash up on the screen so you can see drawings of what they look like as you talk to them. But there is a certain coldness, a certain atmosphere to Citizen Sleeper that I just find to be the most immersive and affecting thing. It reminds me of like a range of references that go from Asimov's AI awakenings um, and that, that kind of what is life, where does machine life become conscious, sentient life, those kind of classic sci-fi questions. It reminds me a little bit of Blade Runner, the lives that the replicants make for themselves. It made me think of um, Pris, the replicant Pris, if you've seen Blade Runner. She has a rough life, but she has a couple moments of happiness amongst all of the, the horror um, that she suffers in the film Blade Runner. Um, and they are fragile moments of happiness where she'll just laugh or have a spark of joy. Um, and it's these hard-won moments of happiness hard-won moments of calm that I find myself thinking about uh, when I'm playing Citizen Sleeper. It also has a, a strange nighttime atmosphere. I think that's partially to do with the electronic score as well. Um, it reminded me of Burial, um, and specifically the song Archangel. Um, and that, that style of music, that warp, mu warp, warp Records electronic nighttime sound, makes me think of like sitting on the front at the top of a double-decker bus coming through London at night when the streets are almost empty. There is just neon light everywhere, the glittering shops, the neon signs, um, going through Piccadilly Circus on a night bus when no one is really around and you're just listening to that kind of music. It's this nocturnal um, metropolitan loneliness. Um, Citizen Sleeper has that atmosphere in spades. Um, but the, the two DLC that exist now, one of them is called Flux, um, and one of them is called Refuge. And in this story arc, um, a flotilla of refugee ships arrives at Erlin's Eye, which is the space station at the centre of this story. 
Um, it's a, a ring, half of which, or some of which, is gone completely. It's hanging together by nuts and bolts. Um, it used to be um, owned by a mega corporation and has since become a bit of a wild land. There is a government, but they don't really hold power. There is an organized crime underworld. There are various tribes of people that inhabit different parts of Erlin's Eye. It's like a fractured society um, with lots of different people all trying to play by different kinds of rules. Um, and you encounter all kinds of them on your way through Citizen Sleeper. You will encounter the gangsters. You will encounter the um, the council people who are trying to, to run this thing, <laughs> uh, local politicians and so forth. Um, and the arrival of the flotilla to Erlin's Eye causes... Um, upheaval, uh, much in the same way as it is in the real world. Um, it's another thing that Citizen Sleeper does so well, is that it taps into contemporary themes and casts them in a sci-fi light. And so once again, you as the sleeper find yourself embroiled in the events that are taking place on Erlin's Eye. You meet a couple of people called Peak and Eshe, um, and they are trying to get food to through a blockade uh, to the flotilla, um, and in the episode Flux, that's what you're trying to do. You have to make decisions about whether to help them or not, uh, whether to prioritise your own safety um, or go into danger to try and help these people do what looks to, to be a good thing. Um, but something that this game does as well is to add layers to moral problems. And so as you are trying to navigate the story of Flux, you will find that there are more layers to it then are comfortable, and that well-meant intentions can go in various directions, and that inaction can have unforeseen consequences. Um, so I won't spoil the story here, but I will say that Flux and Refuge were a really welcome uh, thing for me. It was absolutely wonderful to dip back into the world of Citizen Sleeper. I missed it in a strange way. Um, it's a really special game, and I'm so happy that we're getting more of it. Um, I think that the Flux Refuge and the third part that is still forthcoming, they do form a, a significant addition to this game. Um, if you were to play this game now, you'd be getting just, you know, plus 20% in terms of plot um, and in terms of gameplay. Um, and as you are playing through them as well, you get to slip into your old routines of trying to source the medication that you need to survive, of doing jobs in exchange for currency, exchanging currency for all different kinds of things that you need, um, trying to decide how to spend your dice. It's just such a, a comfortable set of mechanics um, that it was just lovely to slip straight back into them. It felt so comfortable. Um, so I'm really happy to have had an excuse to dip into Citizen Sleeper again. I will be talking about this game again um, throughout the Games of the Year season, and I will probably talk about it again when this DLC trilogy wraps up at the start of next year. So that's Citizen Sleeper, Flux and Refuge. And before we get on to talking about God of War Ragnarok, I would like to say this is a patron-supported show. Um, there are a whole bunch of patrons who support this podcast on Patreon. You can do so at patreon.com slash gaminginthewild. And what you get in return is a whole uh, playlist of bonus episodes about video game music, about the music that I listen to out there in the world, about travel, um, a couple of spoiler casts about games, that kind of thing, just extra Gaming in the World content. I think there are now nine episodes, and you get instant access to all of those if you become a patron. You also get an invitation to Discord, where you can hang out, recommend games, tell us what you're playing. It's a really sparky, lively, friendly little corner of the internet to come and talk games, be a part of the podcast community, and show your support for the show. So if you would like to join us, I would really appreciate that. I really appreciate all my patrons. Thanks so much for taking that leap and supporting the show it's patreon.com slash gaming in the wild if you'd like to get involved with that with all of that said let's move on and talk about god of war ragnarok So God of War Ragnarok has been hard to miss if you follow the gaming zeitgeist. It is one of the big AAA releases of this year. Um, it is the sequel to 2018's God of War Reimagining, which I did an episode about a few episodes ago. Um, and that in itself uh, is follows on from a long series of games um, that spans a couple of decades about Kratos, the Greek God of War, who is 
a figure that has been written into mythology. It's a whole new uh, fictional branch of the the existing mega fiction of uh, Greek mythology. In 2018, God of War, Kratos arrives in the north, the, the Northlands, I guess, in the Norse region uh, with the Norse gods. Um, and having slain most of the Greek pantheon, he and his son carve out a life as mortals. However, the peace doesn't last. Kratos is swept up once again in godly drama. Um, and he and his son go on a long voyage to um, scatter the ashes of his late wife and of his son Atreus' mother. Um, and the game culminates with that taking place. Um, and God of War Ragnarok happens two years later. So we return to Kratos and Atreus as they continue that plot arc that was set up in the 2018 game. It is by Santa Monica Studios. It is published by Sony, which means it is a PlayStation exclusive. It's available for PS4 and for PS5. I played it on PS5. It ran flawlessly. It was 4K 60fps throughout. I believe it's dynamic resolution, but honestly, if it ever changed, I didn't notice. Uh, it's very clean. It's bug-free. Um, it's done very well critically. Um, it has a Metacritic score of a towering 94 um, which confuses me a little based on my experience of the game. Um, I do wonder if the critics were somewhat um, influenced by the stature and the expectation around this release. Um, I've got some critique, I've got some notes, uh, but we'll get into that. Um, How Long to Beat has it at between 24 and 50 hours based on whether you want to complete the story or you want to go all the way and do all of the extra stuff. There is um, quite a lot to do in this game and a lot of it is optional. It took me 29 hours in my playthrough. Um, I think it was a fairly leisurely playthrough. I did um, I did three big optional areas that are really, really hefty actually. Um, probably about a third of the game is just purely optional content and I did some of it. I didn't do some of the optional combat stuff um, and the harder optional bosses, but I did do most of the optional exploration and additional areas, some of which are pretty, pretty good stuff, actually. Um, and the studio describes it as this. Fimble Winter is well underway. Kratos and Atreus must journey through the Nine Realms in search of answers as Asgardian forces prepare for a prophesied battle that will end the world. Explore stunning mythic landscapes and face fearsome gods and monsters as Kratos and Atreus choose between their own safety and the fate of the realms. And my take on this one is that it is an extravagantly produced continuation of God of War 2018's melancholy, cinematic and spectacular father-son journey. The gameplay is very familiar, while the story trades 2018's intimate cast, tight focus and emotional heft for a meandering MCU-influenced romp through Norse mythology. So that will tell you what some of my criticisms of this game are. It strikes a very different timbre to the 2018 game, which had a very stripped-down cast. There was only a handful of characters, um, and you got to know them very well, and they were closely studied in many ways. I feel that the dynamic between Atreus and Kratos... Uh, was the main mainstay of the 2018 game, in the same way as Joel and Ellie um, were the mainstay of The Last of Us. And the complex emotional connection between a young son who is coming of age slowly and a protective father who has dark past and is trying to hide that and to try and uh, conceal his own nature and to try and hide that from his son and to prevent his son from going down that same path. And that concealment being something that creates difficulty for Atreus, who feels that he doesn't fully understand his own nature. So the 2018 game had quite a, an interesting story going on in that respect. Um, and that stuff does continue to some degree here. It continues on the trajectory of Kratos discovering his, um, his uh, what would you say, his like humanity. He is a god. But he's kind of rediscovering his his own emotional range, um, and he's allowing himself to feel, and he is slowly opening up. And all that stuff does continue in this story. Um, Atreus becomes a much more developed character. He, he takes a greater role in this story. Um, and there is a big cast of characters in this one. We, we are, New characters are thrown at us really quite often um, from the first scenes of the game through to the last scenes of the game. There are some characters that you meet in the final stampede um, 
that you really don't have time to get to know. Um, and they are different kind of characters. There was a little bit of comic relief in the 2018 in Brooke and Sindri, uh, the dwarf brothers. Um, but in this sequel, um, there's a lot of that kind of thing. There is a lot of MCU, like buff dudes cracking jokes. Um, and that bothered me a great deal. I felt that it shifted the tone of the game. Um, and the story in this game feels less organized than God of War 2018, I would say, which was very tight, which had you following um, a trajectory as straight as an arrow, pretty much. Um, you had a clear goal in mind for the whole game, that is to find the highest peak in the Nine Realms to scatter ashes. Um, and Kratos and Atreus' journey, even though it became somewhat tangled and meandering, um, always had that strong purpose in mind. It was a game about mourning, um, it was a game about uh, parenthood, and it was a game about childhood to some degree as well, a game about identity. There was lots of themes going on in that game. Ragnarok um, has a lot going on. Not, It's not as focused, it's not as carefully manicured. Uh, the themes of the game, to me, felt up in the air. Um, it seemed to introduce lots of different thematic elements, um, the tone was uneven based on the, the more comedic nature of many of the characters. Um, the environments are dizzyingly different to the first game. And so the whole thematic consistency um, of the first game is out of the window. And what we get instead is a much more colourful, much more playful um, game. But I think that that is perhaps to the detriment of the game. But anyway, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So the game carries on pretty much from where the last game left off. There has been a two-year interval um, since the events of the first game. Uh, and what has been going on in that time is that Kratos and Atreus have been camped out in their cabin where the first game begins. Um, they have been training for the forthcoming uh, Ragnarok, which is prophesized to occur when a long, cold winter descends over the realms. That winter has begun, um, and so Kratos and Atreus are getting ready for Ragnarok. Uh, they're being hunted by a god who they wronged in the 2018 game. They have protection staves around their cabin so they can sleep safely at night, but anytime they have to go out hunting, anytime they have to travel outside of the confines of the cabin and its immediate surroundings, they are set upon by this vengeful god, and that's where the game begins. But after a confrontation with a couple of uh, gods high up in the Nordic pantheon, um, Kratos and Atreus realise that they are no longer safe. And Sindri and Brock, the dwarven brothers from the first game, take them in to their hidden house, which is through a portal in a secret hidden place, a little pocket of the magic realms. Um, and they have like a big, beautiful house that will become the hub of this game. Um, it becomes your new base where you can be safe from these rampaging, vengeful gods hidden away secretly. Um, and so this game has a hub to it, which is quite nice. Um, it's different to the cabin. The cabin we've seen, it's small. We are familiar with it from the first game. And so we get this big spacious hub with a little more life to it, a roaring fireplace, the Dwarven brothers working away on their smithing, several different rooms and so forth. And there's rooms for other characters to come and join as well. And from here, they realise that the prophecy of Ragnarok is, after all, only a prophecy. Um, and this is where the main thrust of this game's themes are set up. Um, if Kratos has managed to move on from his past, from his rage-filled, god-murdering, uh, god-of-war past, and he has become a father, and he has learned to open up his heart a little again, if Kratos can shake off that prophecy... Can Atreus and Kratos and their assembled uh, cast of comrades um, avert Ragnarok? If prophecy can be broken is the main question of this game. And so they set off through the realms to basically test the theory of free will versus determinism. Um, are you what you are intrinsically or do you have free will and agency? Um, and in this case is the prophecy inevitable. Um, and I have you all been swept into it already. So there's lots of rumination in this game about the nature of things, the nature of people, that sort of thing. 
And one of the things that this game does differently uh, from the original game, most of which took place in Midgard, the, uh, the snowy human realm, we did get to go to Alfheim in uh, God of War 2018, this glowing, godly, elven realm. And we did get glimpses of a couple of other realms. Um, but in this game, we will spend a lot more time in some of those realms. We'll spend more time in Niflheim, which is the dwarven realm, uh, full of deserts and dust and industry. And we'll spend more time in Vanaheim, uh, which is a lush green forest realm where the Vanir live. The Vanir, who are another sp uh, sp species or uh, race of gods, um, in contrast to the Aesir, um, who are the, the warlike gods at the top of the pantheon. Uh, the Vanir are like lower gods, or at least have been subjugated by the Aesir. Um, and we'll also go to Helheim, the world of the dead, and so forth. Um, and I will say that one of the best things about this game is the beautiful environment. It is a wonderful looking game. Um, and whilst the the graphics, in inverted commas, themselves are pretty much the same as 2018, it's not like a huge leap. I think God of War 2018 is is about as good as video games have ever looked. Um, and so there is no big generational leap here. Um, I would say it's a refinement and it's more of an art style change. Like if the first game was mostly in this snowy realm and it had this coldness to it that was interspersed with little sojourns into different realms. This game is largely set between the realms. So without wishing to give too much away, let's just say that you'll be traveling through lots of different uh, colourful realms, all of which have um, different things going on in them. They have sub-stories going on in them, um, almost to a fault in, in that it's, it feels somewhat fractured with regard to the whole narrative. Um, little story crumbs sprinkled throughout all of the realms. Um, but it does look absolutely beautiful. The detail is great. The lighting is great. You can walk slowly through any scene in this game, um, and if you just look around at all of the the beautifully rendered locations, the the light and shadows, the the leaves, the nature, the in interiors and exteriors, just everything going on is absolutely beautiful in this game. It's stunning visually. Um, the music is great too. It's this uh, you know it's this choral chest thumping, doon 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 like viking stuff going on um some orchestral music too um, there's some quite dreamy stuff in there there's some nice um mellow orchestral stuff in there as well at the quiet moments um and so i would say the presentation is a big plus for god of war ragnarok if if you like to play a beautiful looking game and you aren't concerned too much about a story that hangs together or compelling gameplay um, then God of War could be the game for you. It's certainly a powerhouse that shows off the PS5. Uh, you can choose between performance and fidelity modes, um, so you can have ray tracing, or you can go for solid 60 FPS. Um, there's just a wonderful visual feast here for fans of that kind of thing. But unfortunately, it's not all positive um, in my mind when I'm talking about God of War Ragnarok. Um, what this gameplay amounts to is achingly familiar gameplay. Uh, we'll move through these beautiful, colourful environments um, and these compelling situations and scenarios. But what we're doing is really very basic a lot of the time. We're searching for a person or a MacGuffin um, through largely linear environments. Um, there are a couple of hubs that give the impression of choice, um, but really they are wide linear sections. It's not a true open world. You don't really have choice in this game. You are shepherded through many, many corridors. Um, and what you do in those corridors isn't great. It's uh, three rune chests, as we know from God of War 2018, which are basically just very boring Where's Wally puzzles, in inverted commas, where you just have to smash three runes to open a chest. They are ostensibly optional, but in practice you do, um, you need what's in those chests to level up, so they aren't really optional. Um, we traverse by boat, sled, or mostly on foot. Um, there are combat arenas where you have to kill enemies until they're all dead, um, sometimes in waves. There are mini-boss encounters, which are less um, less compelling than I would like. There are 
more varied mini bosses, I suppose, but it still feels like they they repeat them a lot. Like there's this um, centaur, there is this uh, big lizard uh, that's called a drecky, um, and you you fight them again and again. So despite the fact that they've attempted to address the criticism. Um, of enemy enemy variety that was applied heavily to God of War 2018 um, still doesn't feel very varied. Like, a lot of the enemies are different kinds of dude, for example. Like, maybe they have a shield. Um, maybe they look like a Viking. Maybe they look like a zombie. Their attacks are slightly different, but it's just different varieties of dude uh, most of the time. Um, so they seem to have tried to address the uh, enemy variety problem, but not mastered it by any means. Um, it still feels very repetitive in combat. Um, and something that the God of War games thrive on is cinematic boss encounters with giant creatures, with gods as big as mountains, with giants, with dragons, and that sort of thing. Um, I found them to be largely disappointing in this game. There was nothing in this game that was as good as the opening boss fight with Baldur in the 2018 game or with the dragon from the 2018 game. There is one boss fight that touches on it, um, but fighting, for example, Thor, the god of lightning, was just against it was a fight against a big, crackling, buff dude, um, completely unspectacular, um, compared to the craziness of the Baldur fight from 2018, where you are crunching through cliff sides and falling into cracks in the earth. Um, the Thor um, boss fight is really just fighting a big dude in a, a little circle. Um, pretty disappointing. Um, there are also collectibles in this game, endless amounts of armour, charms that you don't really need. Um, there is a very tangled and pointless upgrade system with XP that doesn't really do a whole um, great deal. Um, the armour is interchangeable, doesn't really affect gameplay that much, um, unless you maybe crank it up to give me God of War difficulty. Um, but for my playthrough, which was usually on either normal or cranked down a notch, so it was two out of five, just because I wasn't enjoying the game and I wanted to get through it faster. Um, the armor didn't really matter to me. Um, there are also lots of puzzles in this game um, as you're moving through these linear sections to do with gates, unlocking gates, uh, weights, pulling things up and down, pulleys, pushing boxes, flicking switches. Really, really poor, uh, largely boring, I would say. Um, and after you've done all of these um, combat arenas, puzzle encounters, which are often achingly dull, um, I would say achingly dull, not just not just pot boiler gameplay, um, but why do I have to do this? Like almost like um, just wriggling in my chair, just wishing it was over. Um, if you are ever feeling that playing a video game and having to force yourself through it, something has gone pretty pretty wrong. I would say. But, you know, I spent 70 bucks on this game. I wanted to see what the finale was like, and so I kept on pushing through. Um, I would say that I often had to force myself to come back to it. Um, I would say that I was not looking forward to diving into Ragnarok after work, um, as I was with Horizon, for example, which just drew me to it magnetically. I didn't want to do anything else. Um, even Elden Ring, um, which isn't really my kind of game, um, had a more compelling, addictive effect on me than God of War Ragnarok, which I genuinely didn't want to play at some points and just did almost out of obligation to see through the story. Um, so I had a, a bit of a, a mixed re response to this game. Um, I wanted to see the story through, um, but I did find that the story was full of loose ends, full of MacGuffins, um, full of chasing little fragments of a mask that doesn't really have any great shakes in the story and doesn't feel compelling at all. Um, trying to find little gizmos that will maybe let you into another place or trying to find something that will let you create a weapon that will help you out in the big battle. Um, and it's all just a little bit loose and flimsy. Um, it all feels a little bit like excuses to push you around this world. Um, and so I really feel that this game is a shadow of uh, God of War 2018, um, and it did not hit me in the same way. Um, I think that they've exchanged the the clarity of that pared down, disciplined approach to storytelling um, with huge peaks of spectacular boss battles um, that then give way to these quiet moments between father and son. All of that is out of the window here. You're just bouncing from encounter to encounter. 
Um, there's lots of comedy relief, as I've said. At one point, a squirrel appears that looks like it was plucked from a Pixar movie. Um, like, I don't know, like a Rabbids movie or something. Just like a stupid furry squirrel with an eye patch um, that starts talking to you and jumping on you. And at that point, I think I just checked out of the game to some degree. I was like, okay, they've just, they've gone there. This is no longer the um, the sad, somber, brooding, uh, interesting game that God of War 2018 was. This is now full Marvel Universe. Let's slug it out with Thor and then go and talk to our furry squirrel friend. Uh, ridiculousness. Um, and there is a lot of that in God of War Ragnarok, sadly. Um, as far as the gameplay goes, I, I will say that I was struck by how little it has evolved. Um, while the graphics are, or the art style, art direction is, um, I would say, stronger, uh, the gameplay is pretty much the same. You're doing the same things. If you've played God of War 2018 and loved it, then you will get more of it here. There are only a handful of things that are new, um, so I thought I would go through them. Um, the Wolf Drawn Sled is a faster um, and really fun variant on the rowboat of the last game, the canoe that you use in the last game. Um, the sled's pretty cool. It's it's fun. Like, as you're dragged across snow, the haptic feedback makes you feel the snow. And when you go over bumps and stuff, and when you go over ice, um, the quality of vibration in the controller changes and you feel like you're hissing over ice. Um, so that was really fun. It's nice to have a new mode of transport, even if it doesn't change anything and it's only in a couple sections. There is also the addition of a hook shot um, that allows you to... Because, you know, the climbing in God of War is pretty slow. It's like you walk up to a climbing spot, which has a rune carved onto it. You press the button, and then you push up, and Kratos very slowly shimmies up a cliff. Um, in this version of the game, they have decided to add a hook shot. So if you can see, like, a little coloured blob, um, like, you know, 10 metres above you, if you hit the circle button, I think it is, then you will... Um, throw a grapple and just pull yourself up within a couple of seconds. So they've tried to speed up the traversal with this hook shot. Um, I appreciate that. Um, it also works for descending, so you can look down a cliff, and rather than having to shimmy down for 10 seconds of animation, you can hit that button and hook shot your way down the cliff in two seconds. That's great. Very welcome. Um, I wish they'd done something similar with the, the squeezing through cracks thing. Um, there is so much squeezing through cracks in this game. Um, I wish that they had done a similar thing as they have with the hookshot and just let Kratos smash it or something, just walk through it. That would be cool. Um, just speed it up, basically. Um, they've added a couple of new puzzle mechanics. Um, the water wheel mechanic. So there are large sort of sluices of water, like large gutters that um, that go overhead with water pouring out the end of them. And if you throw your axe to um, halfway down that sluice, it will freeze and the water will overflow and make a water wheel work. Um, so that is a new puzzle mechanic uh, where you can freeze water. Um, that's pretty much it in terms of puzzle newness. Um, there are also sigil arrows though. So Atreus, if you hit square, will fire arrows. So he's like your little combat buddy um, in a way that I quite like actually. So if you need to get a breather in combat, you can use the arrows to increase stun on an enemy, for example, or to aggro them away from you if it's a boss. Very, very useful. Um, they've added a puzzle mechanic to that too now. So sigil arrows are special kinds of arrows that you can flick between using the D-pad. Um, if you use the purple one, I forget what it's called exactly, um, but you can send arrows that will create an area on scenery, like a big circle. Um, and if you chain those circles together, for example, if there is a torch on one side of a tree and there is a torch that needs to be lit on the other, if you use the sigil arrows to link one torch to the other, it will carry the flame through these sigils um, and light the other torch. So there is now a sigil arrow puzzle mechanic. That's something new. Um... I don't want to spoil what else is new about this game in case you are thinking of playing it, um, but there are some other quite surprising mechanics that change things up quite a lot and in a way that I quite liked, um, and that's to do with player characters and that sort of thing. Um, and as this game progresses, um, you will go through a whole bunch of story hoops as Ragnarok approaches. Um, there's more stuff about prophecies, there's more stuff about destiny, there are twists and turns that felt to me like a superhero movie, like more on the level 
of like um, you know Avengers movies than let's say The Last of Us, which has that dramatic grit to it, um, and it has an emotional depth to it. Um, God of War does not focus on what made. Uh, God of War 2018, a special game. That was the the approach to storytelling, the subtlety, the father-son relationship. In my opinion, um, that's what made that game a cut above other action-adventure games. Also, the hugely spectacular, hugely successful and spectacular and climactic boss fights. Um, so for me personally, who enjoys the emotional subtlety and depth um, of this interesting father-son relationship, I mean, it wasn't even as good as Joel and Ellie in the last game, but it was good enough to keep me interested and who enjoyed the climactic boss fights. I would say that the story is much worse here. Um, it's often you'll do something and then forget what you're doing halfway through because it's just ill-defined. It feel like, feels like it lunges in various directions to make you go to various realms. You don't really know what you're doing. You're like, yeah, okay, I have to go to the the mushroom realm to get the crystal of whatever because that's going to help me do something that I've forgotten as well. Like, it just turns into mumbo-jumbo in this game, so the motivations of the character are less... The characters are less pure. Um, the things that they are doing are less succinct and less well-chained together, um, and it feels like just a whole bunch of baloney by the end of it, to be frank. Um, but let's go through the good things and bad things about God of War Ragnarok. Um, so the good things I would say are some of the central performances are awesome. Uh, Freya returns. She was my favourite character from the last game. Um, she is a goddess of the woods and that sort of thing. She's a woodsy goddess, witchy woodsy. Um, she is fantastic. Her, her character actress does an amazing job. She has a very emotive face. Her voice acting is great. Anytime Freya is on the screen, um, she's stealing that scene, basically. Um, I really enjoyed the performance of Tyr, a new god that appears in this game. Um, he made a really good foil for Kratos' struggle. He is the uh, the Nordic god of war, the Norse god of war. And so he has experience of the horrors that Kratos has been through as well, and has come out in a very different place. Um, he has a plot twist that I hated, but what are you going to do? Uh, Sindri and Brooke are back as main characters, and they are back bigger. Like, we spend a lot of time with Sindri and Brooke. They are more than just, like, uh, bit part players this time. They have big parts to play in this story. Um, and I think that the voice actors did a great job as Sindri and Brooke as well. Um, the hub house is wonderful. It's so nice to have somewhere to return. It's cozy and beautiful. Um, it has this shimmering blueness to the inside of it. Um, it just feels like the most dreamy, um, spaced out, like magical cabin. Um, I was always happy to come back there. I really did enjoy the the, the hub. Um, it makes it feel like more of a centered campaign this time. Less like in the first game, it was a linear A to B journey. Uh, this game isn't like that. It's like you come back to the hub, you go out and do your thing in Vanaheim, you come back to the house again. Um, so it's more like you're doing all of these excursions into different places. Um, not sure that worked. Like, there was something amazing about the A to B thing in God of War. The journey itself, like only seeing the open road ahead of you for most of that game was just very exciting. It had that road trip vibe. This is different. It's more like a campaign, um, and it is a campaign. Um, so it loses some of the excitement of being a journey, but it, give, it gives the story a centre in a way that is quite cool. Um, and as you um, draw new characters to you throughout this game, they will inhabit that hub and so it gets the feeling of a hangout uh, with lots of ambient dialogue going on like a low level version of what they did with uh, Guardians of the Galaxy you get to see these characters interacting in a fun ambient way um, there were a couple of good boss fights but I don't want to spoil them there is one with a giant creature that is the highlight of the whole game um, in terms of boss fights um, and it's it's with a, a large wolf um, very, very large. Um, and that was really, really, really exciting. Um, and there are a couple of great moments as well where you will release these uh, large-scale mythic beasts. Um, that was really enjoyable. Um, it was nice to see these cinematic moments that kind of caught you a little off guard. So they were sprinkled in there. Um, as for the bad stuff, I've been pretty heavy on that already, so I'm just going to skip through my notes here. I would say that pretty much all of the non-combat gameplay is bad, um, or at least wasn't fun to me. 
Um, I would tear out the crafting system, the skill system, the the muddled UI um, with its bizarre contextual button presses that change from screen to screen. Um, you don't need all that leveling up stuff. You don't need all of that complexity. Um, it felt like a big waste of time. Um, I would delete all of the puzzles from this game that involve water wheels, uh, opening doors, sigil arrow puzzles. It's just a fluff, really. Um, it feels like it's only there to slow you down, to give you... It's like there's a big hole that says gameplay goes here, and they've just um, put some stuff in there that you have to chew through like gristly meat in order to get to the next story beat. I would say that the change of focus in the story was bad. Um, it lacks gravitas in the in the, the way that the 2018 game had that going for it. Um, it lacks an emotional core. Um, it's confused. It feels like the direction of this game was confused to me. It lacks the clarity of vision that made the 2018 game good. It's misfiring all over the place, uh, this story. Also, lots of loose ends, lots of just, like, questions. Like, there's one part where you have to go into hell and you are led to a dead end. It's never explained. Just a big monster appears um, and you fight the monster and leave. But it's never explained why you were drawn to that dead end in the first place. It's just this big, juicy... A loose end hanging out of the story. And I guess it expects you just not to ask those questions. Like, why were we doing this again? Why were we really doing this? Other than the fact that it was a mission marker. Um, it doesn't expect you to tug at those loose ends. And if you do, the whole thing starts to come apart. There are just so many of them. And that wasn't the case in 2018. It was very focused, very crisp, very concise. Um, I would say that the spectacular bosses aren't spectacular a lot of the time. Like the the Thor fight, huge disappointment. Um, the big wolf was the only good fight in the game, really, in, in, in terms of the spectacle. Nothing was a patch on Balder or the dragon. Um, lots of big guys crunching each other. Um, the enemy variety hasn't been solved. Uh, different kinds of guys, different kinds of bipedal animals with slightly different attacks. Um, not so good, really. I would also say that sometimes the story just seems weird and wrong. Like, there is this big lunky Viking who is hanging around with you sometimes in, in group scenarios. At one point in the game, he kind of sacrifices himself to save you. Um, and this is played as a big emotional moment in the game. Um, but I was actually laughing out loud at how inappropriate and badly judged it was. Like, this, this guy that I don't know nothing about jumps out of a boat to save me and I'm supposed to feel something, all the characters are super sad, and I'm like, who was that guy again? Um, why did he do that? That's just such a silly story beat. And there's a lot of stuff like that. Um, just the judgment on what to cut and what to keep, it all feels a little confused and cobbled together um, throughout. Um, some of those story beats are just off the charts uh, poor, I would say. And all of this leads me to question, like this is a 94 game, it's up for the Game of the Year Award at the Game Awards. It's riding high as one of the highest reviewed games ever on Metacritic. It's just a mark below Elden Ring. Um, critics love this game. It was universally lauded, pretty much. Um, and I'm left thinking, is my taste just that different um, to game critics at large? Or is the things that I found interesting in the 2018 game... Um, are they not the things that everyone else found interesting? Were people more interested in the combat than I was? And so they're happy to play more of the combat. Are people more invested in Kratos than I was? And so they're just happy to see Kratos on the screen and happy to hear more of uh, Christopher Judge's voice acting and all of that stuff. Or um, is this just a game that was expected to score tens across the board um, and no one wants to be the one that sticks their neck out and says, is this actually good? Um, I was interested to watch the the MinMax um, spoiler cast. They have a, a show called The Deepest Dive. It's three different podcasts. Um, one of them covers the first third, middle third, and last third of the game. It's a panel of people that talk about it. And in the last episode, um, it had Kyle Bosman, it had Jill Grote, and it had Shuriel Vasquez as guests, and all of them took this game to task, a little bit like I have here, um, and critiqued the story, critiqued the combat, critiqued the character development. Um, but somehow, still, even at the end of that podcast, everyone was like, this was a great game, though. And I'm left thinking, was it really? 
Um, to me, this was not a great game. It was barely a good game. To me, it's a 6 or a 7 out of 10. Um, so I'm a little confused about why I come down so differently on this one. Uh, maybe it just comes down to the fact that I don't really like the Marvel movies. I don't really like mainstream uh, popcorn cinema. I like other things, you know. I like the citizen sleepers of this world. I like the things with subtlety um, and thought and something to say. I'm not sure that God of War Ragnarok really has anything to say. Um, so maybe I will cool off on the AAA reviews for a while and get back to doing what I know I like more and what I think that this show is good at. So thank you for sticking with me through this review. Um, that is God of War Ragnarok. So thanks for sticking with me through my little existential crisis of why why did I play that game and why am I talking about it? Um, but thankfully, back at the start of the podcast so many years ago, we did talk about Wave Tail. I'm really excited about that game. I'm going to talk about that one more. Um, and we, I did talk about Citizen Sleeper, Flux and Refuge. Um, those are uh, good, good games. And so I'm happy that I got to recommend them to you again. Um, God of War Ragnarok, not so much, but you know, there's a lot of people on the internet with opinions about that game. Mine is just one in a mountain. So if you didn't like mine, I'm sure you can find one out there that you will like. There's loads of people out there that love it. Thanks very much for sticking with me through that review. This has been Gaming in the Wild. I've been your host, John. I'll be back next week, hopefully with the first in a series of Games of the Year episodes where we're going to get this show back on track, <laughs> recommending games um, like I like to do. I'm so excited for Games of the Year season. I have um, a, a strong list this year. Um, I think I have 17 games, and there are games in that list that have been in 15th place, and they have been in second place, and they have been up and down the charts. So I'm really not sure where I'm going to come down this year. My list is not formed at all. And in fact, I'm hoping that the uh, the Games of the Year episodes that will happen across the next month will help me to solidify my views a little bit. They'll help me to examine my views. I think it will be a useful test for me to talk about those games, to talk about all of the great games that came out this year, um, to go through them one more time, to hash them out and to see what kind of passion comes out of you. You know, like um, how passionate are you really and like how much... Um, do you love each one and which game surprises you in how much you love to talk about it and that kind of thing. So I'm really looking forward to Games of the Year season. Going to have some great guests and some great discussions. Um, I hope you'll be along for the ride. I will finally mention this is the patron supported show so feel free to join us at patreon.com slash gaming in the wild i also really appreciate any star ratings on spotify any written reviews on apple podcasts um, i really appreciate anyone who shares this podcast with friends um, i got my spotify wrapped for the show and it turns out a lot of people are sharing this show so thank you very much if you're someone that's been sharing it with friends uh, do come and find me on twitter as well i'm at gaming in the wild on twitter and instagram and so forth i'd love to hear from you Thanks very much for listening. This has been Gaming in the Wild. I'll be back next week. Take care of yourselves and each other, and bye-bye for now.